Should you overexpose your log footage? Yeah, probably, but there are a couple sets of trade-offs, so let's talk about it. All right, so here's our light aimed directly at the scene. So this is a pretty intense shot here. Now I've got this camera at ISO 4000, which happens to be its second base ISO. Got the lens wide open and we're at 1 1000. And you see, despite that, the camera actually says this is the recommended exposure. So we're gonna record a couple seconds of that here. And then we're gonna stop and we're gonna go down to uh, C1500. And you can see we're a stop over now. Record a couple seconds there, C250. Now we're two stops over. This is getting pretty intense here. And now I'm gonna go down to 125 and you can see we're now flashing because of how overexposed we are. Uh, and despite that, uh, there's no, uh, barely any clipping. I've got my uh, clipping zebras set there. So we'll just uh, record here. Okay, and uh, we'll bump that down to finally one over 60. And uh, now we're starting to get my clipping zebra marks there. Okay, so we've got those clips in Resolve, and we're going to take a look at them here. Now, uh, as you can see, we go up and up a stop in our S-log, and uh, it looks pretty unrecoverable, and it looks even worse when I enable color management here. You can see that looks pretty bad, uh, and would be kind of difficult to work with, right? Um, so all I've got here, by the way, is just an output display transform. It's just taking our S-log and converting to typical SDR display specs, so Rec. 709, BT1886, with uh, some tone mapping. Um, but I'm going to use a tool to recover our log footage, and I want to show you how that works. And in order to do that, I've got this linear ramp here, and you notice it's a nice clean ramp in our scopes here. So I'm going to go to our HDR wheels, not just the regular wheels, but the HDR wheels, and under this triple dot menu, I'm actually going to say that our color space is S gamma at 3 cine, and I'm going to say that our gamma is S log 3. And now you notice if I drag this exposure control, this isn't just doing like a normal gain adjustment or like a normal gamma or anything. It's actually bending with the curve of S log. Um, and that's really important because that means that this tool is color space aware, or rather it changes its behavior based on what we say about the state of the data that's going through it. So you can see here on my first clip, if I add a node before our display transform, actually we don't need to do that on the first clip. The first clip's fine. What am I doing here? On the second clip, if I make a node before our display transform, and we go in here and we say color space, let's get it through Cine. I don't even know if you need to specify a color space for this one necessarily. All right, we're gonna do, this was one stop over, right? So we're gonna do minus one. And now these two clips match basically perfectly. Let's do that again. So we're gonna go to our next clip. I'm just gonna copy the grade from our last one. Only this one was two stops over. So instead of minus one, I'm gonna do minus two. And now these clips match. We can do it again here. Let's see, apply grade. This one's minus three. And once again, still perfect. Let's go to our last one. This is pretty crazy here. We're gonna apply that, not just minus three, but minus four there. And you can see that these all are fully recovered. Okay, so what is the difference between these recordings now? Well, there are some trade-offs on how you expose your log footage, and we'll start with the most simple and obvious one, which is the trade-off between noise and clipping. So in our first clip here, you can see that there is quite a bit of noise in the shadows, which goes away as we expose up. Now, when we get to our highest exposure recording, we actually did start to lose some detail. You can see on the uh, sign there, it looks like we started losing some color channel detail. And uh, in between the monitors there, I have like a light between these monitors, and you can see we started to lose that. Um, now, this is actually kind of a bad example. If we were outside and there was a sky, you can imagine you might start to lose detail in that sky. Now, of course, we were able to recover the overall exposure of the image, and that seems to match pretty well between all these different clips, but it's all about losing the detail versus where our noise floor is. So I know the log curve thing is kind of confusing, but you can kind of think of it as a bucket that you have to fill. And down here is noise and up here is clipping or losing detail. And you can kind of put your image wherever you want in there, as long as you're not losing something that you care about or burying something that you care about. Now there is another trade-off to how you expose your log footage and it's a little more nuanced and it has to do with how log curves work. I mean, what is even the point of a log curve? Well, a log curve is essentially data compression. You see, we have a massive dynamic range that the sensor is capturing and we have to somehow squeeze that into just roughly a 10-bit video file. And so we need to use some sort of lossy compression to do that. Well, one method of doing that is, like many forms of lossy compression, is to compress away the things that humans tend to not care about. 
the human senses kind of have this diminishing returns thing. We tend to care a lot more about shadow detail. Imagine the difference between one candle versus two candles, that's twice the amount of light, versus 100 candles and 101 candles. Even though you've added the same number, it doesn't really seem like there'd be much difference there, even though that is an entire candle that you've added. That's kind of just how human senses work. We have this sort of diminishing returns perspective. And so with log curves, we can take advantage of that. You can see in this log curve design here, what we do is as light enters the camera, we jump up very quickly in the data that we're storing. But as it gets brighter and brighter, we sort of taper off at the top. So you can think of when you expose your footage, what's actually going on is you have more precision towards the bottom and less precision at the top. And when I say less precision, what I really mean is banding. Now the manufacturers of these cameras optimize the log curve very carefully so that at a correct normal exposure and typical post-production practices, there won't be any noticeable banding. But of course, the more you overexpose your image, you do risk kind of stressing that. Now there's a couple of other factors in that as well, like noise will affect that, the codec can affect that, things like dithering as well. There's all kinds of things in kind of like the color processing pipeline that might affect whether there is banding depending on how the camera is designed. But you can imagine that you are starting to kind of stress that encoding as you start to overexpose the image. Now what makes log curves so powerful is the fact that they're known and defined, typically in a public way. And that means that we can reverse the log encoding and post. And that's really important. And I can actually show you an example of that. So we could just pick on Fuji, for instance. If I go to Google here and we type Fuji F log 2 PDF and we just hit enter, bam, right there, first result on Google. And if we click that, look at that. There is the log curve that Fuji uses in their cameras. And you can actually see here's all of the math that goes into that, which of course you don't need to memorize or anything. But the fact that it's defined is really important because that means we know how the camera is behaving when light goes into the camera. We know how it's writing that light data to the file so we can reverse it later on. Now there's a third trade-off with how you expose your log footage. It's in a little more nuanced, but I wanted to explain it anyway. You see, when a camera records data with its Bayer sensor, that has to be mapped to a usable color space. And there's actually a lot of really advanced math and science that goes into that. And even more so, there's a lot of trade-offs as well, especially when you're in a tiny camera body with limited processing power and limited battery life. You can't just you know do whatever you want for processing. A lot of times you have to make certain trade-offs. And some of those trade-offs are a little interesting. Typically what a camera manufacturer does is they make it so that at correct exposure, things like skin tones will look natural or accurate because that's the biggest thing everyone judges about every camera is how do the skin tones look. But when you get into more extreme examples, like here's an LED fixture that's relatively narrow wavelength and it's a blue light. When you do things like this, the kind of extreme lights, things like concerts and, and dances and stuff like that, and LED fixtures, this starts to push towards the edge of the gamut. And camera manufacturers tend to care a little bit less about this. Like, do we really care about how accurate this is compared to, for instance, normal correctly exposed skin tones? And the reason I mention that is that as you overexpose your log footage, you're starting to push into those extremes. As in the camera manufacturer probably hasn't put as much priority in getting super bright vivid colors or things that are right on the edge of clipping quite as accurate as they would something like correctly exposed skin tones. Because they assume that when you film something, the thing that you care about or whatever the important subject is would be correctly exposed and the things that go out of range are things in the background or things that you don't care about. That's a lot more subtle, of course, and it really depends on the camera. The better the camera, and especially if it's a big cinema camera that has plenty of processing power, it's really not an issue. You shouldn't see too many color shifts or anything like that. But especially in the lower end prosumer cameras, I've noticed that when you overexpose log footage, even if you try to correctly compensate for it in post, you can run into weird color shifts and weird forms of kind of channel clipping and things like that. So it's just worth mentioning. Anyway, hope that was helpful. If you have any comments or questions, let me know. Thanks.